You're listening to audio from Journey Bible Church. Join us every week for sermons from God's Word by subscribing to this podcast wherever you like to listen most. If you would like to connect with us, head to journeybible.org slash connect. Good morning. If you're a a guest, I want to welcome you. Uh, My name is Mike Bickley, and I I serve Jesus on staff here at Journey Bible Church. And this year, we've been um, walking through the Gospel of John, and we find ourselves today in chapter 14. So if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there and follow along uh, with us as we work through it. This group of chapters, 13 through 17, are are all one day in the life of Jesus. It's a day when he's brought his disciples together um, on the night that he's going to be betrayed. And he's pulling them away and speaking to them and preparing them for what's about to come. And uh, last week, we, we, and the, actually the week before, we spent time in John chapter 13 where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And we're going to spend two weeks now in John chapter 14. And he's teaching them in, in these chapters truths that are going to anchor them in the world in which they're going to have to live, a, a world that's going to watch his crucifixion and a world that's going to watch his departure. But there's greater things that are to come. And that's really what this passage is about. It's, it's about the idea that our hearts need to be governed by our trust in God, not by the trouble in our world. And the promise that there is going to be greater things that God is yet to do, not lesser things. And so Jesus is putting them on advance notice that what is ahead is not easy, but what is ahead is better. And they're struggling to believe that. You know, the disciples were on a roller coaster of emotions and circumstances. Just pause for a minute and think about it. Like they had walked with Jesus into Jerusalem, hailed to to shouts of king and hosanna and hallelujah and a recognizing of the laying down of the palm branches and people's coats in the street as Jesus fulfilled prophecy, riding in on a donkey. And they're thinking the kingdom's here. Our king is here. And then just shortly after that, He's being hunted by the Pharisees. There's a death warrant out for Jesus. And they're looking for someone to sell Jesus out. And so they've got these roller coaster of high and lows going on. And if we're all honest, like most of our lives are a roller coaster, right? Of highs and lows. You know, I myself am on a roller coaster right now. The picture on the left there is Elizabeth and I yesterday when we took uh, dinner to my son and his wife after they gave birth to our second grandchild, um, their second grandchild, our third grandchild, Ava Jean. And uh, just a beautiful moment. Um, Just, she was so calm, um, you know, didn't cry when I held her. Um, It was just a a beautiful moment, a celebratory moment, you know, uh, something full of great joy. But the picture on the right, at almost the exact time uh, my brother-in-law took this from me in Texas, is my dad in hospice care. And he's taken a hard turn for the worse, and I've prayed my emotions will stay in check. And uh, that's my uh, stepmom and my sister at his side. And, um, and so, you know, there's this roller coaster going on that I will want to be here for my grandbaby. I want to be there for my dad. And, and, you know, just the dichotomies of life, the polar opposites of the joy of new birth and the, the grief and the mourning of the loss of life. And so, you know, we, we all struggle. We all have these points where our hearts are troubled, where they're in turmoil, maybe even in chaos, if not at least unsettled. And so Jesus is addressing this with his disciples. And many of us, we we tend to look at our emotions and our circumstances, and we see them as a roadblock to what God wants to do in our life. Because in reality, we we long for a perfect world. We long for perfect relationships. We long for perfect health. And all of those desires are actually the right desires. But since the fall, 
They're not reality. And so there's this longing in us for we, what we know should be God's best. And yet we're living in the middle of the enemy's attacks. And so we have to remember that the enemy wants to detour us from trusting God. And he wants to use the troubles and the chaos and the unsettling and the ups and the downs in that way. And we need to remember that God can and does use everything in this world for our good and for his glory. Even what's about to happen to Jesus is God's good and for God's glory and for our good. And so let's look at how Jesus brings comfort to his disciples in the midst of the roller coaster of circumstances and emotions. And to do that, let me pray for us. God, I pray in a, a very real, tangible way for this congregation, the people watching online, the people who might watch later, the ones right here, right in this moment. God, I pray that they would sense your comfort, they would sense your direction. They could feel the stability and security that only you can bring in the roller coaster of life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so the first thing in our passage is uh, John wants to remind us, actually, by recording Jesus' words, that believing in Jesus brings security, not trouble. Believing in Jesus brings stability, it brings peace, it brings good, it brings joy. But we, we need to understand that what is being brought to us is not a promise of external, but a promise of the internal. And so therefore, the promise comes not by you and I having a perfect life, but by you and I believing in a perfect God. And so our life with Jesus is secure and eternal because we believe. Faith can triumph over fear. Trust can triumph over turmoil and trouble. Look with me at verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is an exhortation, a command. He's basically saying that you have the choice of where you will let your heart go. And he says, let not your heart walk down the path of trouble and stay there and make your home in the midst of your trouble. And, and remember, the disciples the, the betrayer has just been identified. The denier, the one who three times will deny Jesus, is in their midst. Christ has told them about his crucifixion. He's being hunted even now by the Pharisees. And so the, the whole idea of trouble is very, very real. But he commands them. He urges them that they should be able, by faith, by believing in God, believing in him, to not have their hearts spiral out of control. But instead, they should put their full trust in God. They should put their full trust in Jesus. I want you to notice that you know, this demands a higher view of Jesus than being just a mere man. When he says that the same faith that you put in God the Father is the same faith that you must put in Jesus Christ. It also is telling us that it's impossible to have faith in God the Father apart from the same faith in Jesus Christ. So he's charging them. He's saying, hold on to your faith. Put it actively every moment of the day in me. Believe. Believe. Hold on. Don't let your heart spiral out of control. Now, you know, you and I hear that, and I, I don't know about you, but I, this week, I want more. I want, I want you to tell me, okay, if I do that, what happens? And I got to tell you, God has a sense of humor that 
the week that my, my dad is declining quickly is a week that I'm preaching on the eternal things of heaven. I just love, and this is a, it's not like I, I woke up and changed the preaching calendar. God is, knows exactly what he's doing. So I, I discover six things in this passage that are reasons why I should choose trust in the moment rather than letting my heart walk down trouble lane. Six reasons. I just want to give them to you. They're very simple, but they're very profound. They're not necessarily temporal. They're eternal. And they're not, they're not so much um, a, a person to hug a, as they are a heart place to dwell. The first one, the Father's house has room for you. The first thing that Jesus is going to tell his disciples is that there is plenty of room, there is plenty of room in heaven for those who believe in the Father, for those who believe in Jesus. There is an expansive space available In my Father's house are many rooms. Now just, that's where Jesus wants to start. In my Father's house are many rooms. Now you and I read that, and you know, the King James um, used the word mansion because it meant a home, but then later on um, we think of mansions as, you know, the, the houses on the coastline that are really, really, really big. And the picture here is not of the necessity of, a, of something super elaborate. It's this idea of an expansive place that has an endless number of rooms that are available for anyone who will believe in Jesus. The word house there literally is the idea of dwelling. And you, you remember that, that uh, God tabernacled or dwelt among us. And, and so it's, there's this idea that the rooms, are the place where we will dwell is with the Father. And, and I think um, the idea of uh, the Father's house is not as much physical as you and I think right now. It's heaven, right? And in, in John will paint a picture in his prophecy in Revelation 21 and 22 of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem of the place where all believers for all time will dwell with God in eternity. And he's going to secure it for them. So he just wants, he wants to start off with his disciples and let them know there's room for all of you in my father's house. And then he gives them a second reason to trust Jesus. And to trust God in the midst of their tur turmoil is Jesus isn't just leaving. He's not just departing. He's not just dying. He won't just ascend to be with the Father. He's actually preparing a place for them. He's preparing a place for you and I. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go prepare a place for you? His departure is not random. It's not accidental. It's not unplanned. It's not outside of God's sovereign plan. It's purposeful. Jesus is going to prepare a place for them. He is going to secure our room. And he's going to do it by offering himself up as the sacrifice for sin. He's making a place for us by making a way for us. Because he will rise from the dead and prove that he has conquered sin and death and has the right to give eternal life. Anyone who believes has a room. Anyone who believes has the Lord making a way for them by himself. You know, you could go ahead and get out your phones and make your room reservations now. If you're a believer... You have a room reservation. My dad has a room reservation. And Jesus left them to prepare a place, and now we get the benefit of that place being prepared. And that brings us to a third reason to trust. Jesus will come again for you. Jesus is coming again. He's going to leave, but he's not leaving us like orphans. Jesus will come again. Again, 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You know, I I don't believe this is just a broad reference to the second coming of Christ. I think this is a specific reference because of the personal nature of it. It's a reference to what Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 4 as, as Jesus catching us up to meet him in the air, the rapture of his church before the tribulation, a promise that he is going to take us to himself. And this promise that that he's coming back, if you will read through the Bible in the New Testament, you, you will find over and over and over references to the expectation of the return of Jesus that we're waiting for Jesus to come back. And so, you know, he takes it a step further. He, he says, I'm not just coming again, but the fourth reason is that he's going to take us to himself. He, he's not just coming again to bring justice on the world. He actually says, I am coming to take you to myself. I will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. This is an incredible promise that we will be with him and in his presence forever. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are chosen, and he's coming for you. You have a room reservation. He will come again, but he's not just coming to bring about justice and pour out wrath on sin. He's coming to take you to be with him forever. See, that's why we can endure. That's why we can go through this, because on the other side is something greater, more glorious, almost unfathomable for us. I will take you to myself. You know, it's interesting. He doesn't go ahead and say, let me give you a tour of the mansion right now. He doesn't even describe doesn't even take any time to describe the rooms or the layout or what you can expect in the Father's house because all you need to know is that he will be there. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. And you are secure now because you are secure in eternity. You are secure now because he is coming for you to take you where he is. This leads us to the fifth reason. And now he makes it just super clear. After the command, believe in me, he makes it clear that there is no other way to find eternal security with God. There's only one way, and it is Jesus. And he is the only way. Notice, that in verse 4, he says to them, you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. Now, I just, I just want you to notice that way is dominating this discussion here. And so, he, you, know, you know, how can we know the way? I am the way. And then he's going to talk about being the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so, you know, he, they, they are, uh, you know, um, he describes for them that you know the way. You, you've been with me. You, you've listened to my teaching. You, you've seen me do what I do, the works that I've done. You heard me talk to Nicodemus. You, you know about that conversation where I told him he must be born again. You were with me when I was with the woman at the well, and I presented myself as Messiah, and then, and then she has to make a response. And then she does, and she invites the whole town to believe in me also. You know the way to where I am going. And Thomas is like, Lord, wait a minute. We don't know where you are going. We don't have an exact understanding of what you're talking about. So if we don't know exactly where you're going, how could we know the way? And I, think about it this way. If I, I said today, hey, would you guys like to go with me somewhere in the Midwest? You go, Mike, okay, Midwest is kind of a large geographical area. 
Are you talking about Kansas City? Are you talking about Omaha? Are you talking about St. Louis? Well, you know, are, are, are you talking about the armpit of the U.S., Arkansas? What, what are you talking about? Like, where are we going to be going? If you give me the destination, then I can plan the route. And that's kind of what Thomas is saying. God, Jesus, just give me an exact understanding and I'll figure out the route. And Jesus said to him, I am. There's that phrase again that John uses absolutely. And in all the statements, I am the good shepherd. I am the light. He uses that I am, the personal name of God from the Old Testament. Jesus associating himself with the name of God. Jesus claiming to have the nature of God. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way. Jesus is the way because it is Jesus that does the work for us and it's through belief in Jesus that we have access. He is the only way to God, the only one that needs to be believed in. He does not just show us the way. Notice that it says he is the way. Access to the Father and being in his presence in his house is only through Jesus and no other. No one comes to the Father. No one makes it to God except through me. He is the only one that can come and take us to the place that has been prepared for us. Salvation, if you want to think about it this way, is a single lane, one way, narrow road. And there's a giant interstate system everywhere leading to all kinds of destinations, but none of them are God. This is, Jesus' teaching is in direct contradiction to the Roman world's understanding, and it's in direct competition with our culture's understanding. There is no other path to God except through Jesus. It's a hard word, but it's the easiest, it's the best. Think about it. If there were two paths to God and you identified 110 different paths, how would you know which two are right? But when God shows up in the flesh to make it simple for everybody on planet Earth, he says, one way. That's why you and I are tasked to take this message to the ends of the earth by Jesus himself. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way because he is the only one who is God, the only one that came from God, the only one that returns to his Father. And because he's the way to God, he is also the truth of God and the life of God. Jesus is the truth. He embodies the supreme revelation of God. He's the narrator of God by being in the flesh. He hears and shares and does only what God the Father tells him to do. He unfolds, he discloses, he reveals God. He is the whole truth and nothing but the truth about God. And he's not just the creator, he's the life. Jesus declares that life is in himself, that he is the resurrection and the life, that he is the true God and he is eternal life. And because Jesus is the truth and he is the life, he's also the way. Jesus is not a trailblazer hoping others are going to follow his path. He's a savior. He is the truth. He is the life. And he is the way. You know, Jesus is the culmination of everything the prophets and the law and the wisdom literature in the Old Testament talks about. Jesus is the word in the flesh. He is the truth. He is the giver of eternal life. He is the only path to God. No other path leads to God except through a relationship with Jesus Christ. No Jew can get to heaven without Jesus. No Gentile can get to heaven without belief in Jesus. 
Jesus is the complete embodiment of the way to God, the full expression of the truth of God, and the sovereign source of the life of God. Jesus, and only Jesus, only his work is sufficient to provide a relationship with the Father. This is some of the strongest teaching, and it comes directly from the mouth of Jesus. And it leads our sixth reason why we should trust, and that is because Jesus has shown you the Father. You know, next door is the show me state. Right? Prove it. Show it to me. And that's kind of the idea behind what Jesus is going to do now is He's going to say, listen, I'm going to give you the ultimate proof. You actually can be secure now and not let your your heart wallow down into the deepest of troubles and you can stay fast, you can endure, you can hope, you can trust because you've already seen the Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him And you have seen him. Now, notice that just, again, the language that's used here is the language of knowledge or the language of relationship, not the language of place. And so entrance into a relationship with the Father is through a relationship with Jesus. Knowing the Father is by knowing Jesus. Now, he's he's basically, and this is true of the disciples in this moment, he's not saying, you know everything about the Father. He's just saying, you've seen the Father, even what you don't comprehend fully, by seeing me. And I have explained, unfolded, disclosed the Father to such a degree that when you see me, you see my Father, because I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. We've seen you. Show us the Father. Give us a theophany. Give us, give us something like Moses and the elders got in Exodus 24, or you got when God passed be- before you and you saw his back. Give us just a moment of glory and revelation like that, and we, it'll be enough. That's all we need. And and Jesus rebukes Philip. Philip, have I been with you so long? I've been with you for three years. We've traveled together. You've heard my teaching. You've watched my miracles. You've watched me do my signs. You've seen my heart break over the lostness of humanity. You've heard me talk to my father. Have I been with you for these three years, this long, and you still do not know me, Philip? By the way, just as an aside, a length of you being a Christian is not a guarantee of a maturity that parallels the length you've been a follower. Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father. You know, Jesus is making an incredibly um, clear declaration of how he views himself. And he views himself as God Almighty, part of the Trinity, God the Son. He doesn't view himself as a great moral teacher. He doesn't view himself as a prophet who can do miracles. He views himself for who he really is existing before eternity, but taking on flesh in the moment. And his claim here to see me is to see the Father is exhaustive and exclusive. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me 
that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. He's talking about a kind of a union. He's repeating this concept over and over in these verses because he wants them to believe that he and the Father are one. And, and that, and by the way, we're going to add the Holy Spirit here just a little bit in this chapter next week. And he's, he's letting them know that they are now seeing an unfolding, a grasping of the mystery of the Trinity. And he's saying that when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. When I speak my words, I speak the Father's words. When I do my works, I do the Father's works. You can't separate them out. And so therefore, what I am and who I am is what the Father does and who he is. Our natures are the same. Believe me, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Believe me. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't just say believe in me. He says believe me. Believe the content of everything that I've shared with you. Believe the content of what I'm saying right now. Believe me when I say these things to you, but also believe in me. So Jesus is not just giving us the content of our faith. He is the object of our faith. And that's why Christianity is not a head religion. It's, it's a heart, whole person religion. It, it's a relationship with God. Now, I want us to just pause for a minute and realize that only you can turn your heart to truth and trust and turn it away from deceit and doubt. He commands you to let not your heart be troubled. He commands you and I not to let our hearts spiral out of control. He commands you and I to not burrow our heart into our circumstances, to not allow our emotions to run away with our heart. He's saying choose by faith to anchor your heart in these realities of eternity and my presence with you now and forever. And my promises to you now and forever. And endure. You know, for me, daily time in the word and prayer are what help me to detox from the prior day deceit and lies of the world that are forced in, crept in, and knock them on the door of my heart all the time. And, and I'm like you, uh, just you guys, sometimes you may look at your pastors and think that they're like a step above you. I'm just here to tell you, I know all the pastors, including myself. We're not a step above you. We're fellow journey people alongside of you. And we, we fail, we, we fall, we falter. And so he, here's something I want you to know. My definition of maturity is not that I don't mess up. My definition of maturity is how quickly I can fess up. When I close the gap between my faltering and my going back to walking by faith, not by sight, that's maturity, when that gap is getting less and less and less. And so I want to challenge you. Some of you, you take days or weeks wallowing with a troubled heart before you, you, you make the decision and the determination that with God's strength and by his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to learn about next week, that will allow you to do that. You, you, you take weeks. How about if you shorten it? Let, let's, if you're a three-week person, let's go to two weeks. If you're a two-week person, let's go to a one-week. If you're a one-week person, let's go to five days. If you're a five-day person, let's go to three days. If you're a three-day person, let's go to one day. If you're a one-day person, let's go to a one-hour person. If you're a one-hour person, let's go to a one-minute person. If you're a one-minute person, it's time for the rapture. See, that's maturity. And, and we're going to see this in the life of the disciples. They're not perfect. But they're going to close that gap between letting their heart be troubled and believing in Jesus. And this brings us to the second concept that's in this passage, and that is believing in Jesus brings greater works, not lesser works. You have the potential. We 
already have experienced greater works than Jesus has ever done. Jesus started the church. We've planted as a church thousands of churches internationally. We've seen tens of thousands of people come to faith. Jesus saw maybe a band of a few hundred, five, six, seven hundred. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, some people interpret this as they have the gift of healing, uh, they have uh, the gift of miracles, they have the gift of signs. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. He, he basically defined himself as the one who brings truth, the one who brings life. And so we are going to carry on his work. We're going to bring the truth and we're going to bring the life. Jesus did the miracles he did to attest to the reality that he fulfills the Old Testament prophecy. But the gospel, he tells us, is what's got to be proclaimed. Disciples need to be made. And so that's the work that Jesus started. That's the work that you and I carry out. That's the work that we're going to do. We will do the work that he did. And greater works than these will he and she do because I'm going to the Father. Jesus said to the disciples, wait. After he left, he says, wait, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit. And in one day, more people came to faith in Jesus than in all of Jesus's ministry. And the reason that can happen is because the Holy Spirit comes into us and empowers and guides and directs us to be his witnesses, but also because Jesus is interceding for us. I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. By the way, in my name... Uh, you and I can think of that as like the Aladdin's lamp, rub the genie's, you know, the edge of the, the thing and out pops the answer. And that's not the idea. In the Old Testament, God would talk about how he does thing, things for his name's sake. And that's what Jesus is saying here. To pray in his name is to pray according to his will, according to his truth. It's to pray according to what he is planning and seeking to achieve in this world, in his people, uh, in the lost. And, And so when we pray in his name, we're basically saying, hey, we come into alignment for what you're trying to do in this world for your name's sake. And because you haven't given us any parameters and you said we can ask you for anything, I'm going to ask in your name, knowing that if what I ask is outside of the parameters of your will, as revealed in your word, then I know you won't say yes. But just in case, it fits with your sovereign plan of what you're trying to do. I pray in Jesus' name for Jesus' glory, for Jesus' purposes. So when you add that on the end of your prayer, it's not a magic button. It's you lining up under him, putting your heart, your will, your desires on track with his. Do you have a pattern of pursuing greater things through prayer? You know, this is, as I've aged very slowly, um, much slower than you guys age. You know, as I've aged, I've noticed looking back on my life, when things got hard, I worked harder. And now I'm, I'm compelled to pray more. Because... The things I see now with such clarity, only God can do. I can't change a heart. I can't move a mountain. Only God can do that. Is that becoming a pattern of your life? Are you trying to make it happen, or are you praying God will make it happen? Greater works he can do because he goes to the Father. And we go to him in prayer. You know, I believe that when Jesus 
answers my prayers, he gets glory. I believe the Father gets glory. I believe that glory is manifested in the most beautiful of ways when prayers are answered. Yesterday morning, I went on a prayer walk, and as I shared with you guys, I was troubled. You know, I wanted to see my dad one last time, and I knew I was supposed to preach this passage and that I needed to be here, and I, I wanted to be here for my new granddaughter. And so I had no choice but to rest in sovereign plans that God has already orchestrated and trust Him, even though I'm wrestling with my feelings and my circumstances. And so I just, I, I told God, I rest in you. I'm completely trusting in you. I'm very comfortable. I feel this way. I know this way. But here's what I hope. I hope you will hold off my dad's death till I can get there this week. And if you do that, I will rejoice in it. And if it doesn't happen, I will rest in you. But I asked him exactly what I wanted for, and yesterday afternoon, I found my dad took just a slight move in the positive. He got mad about it because he was ready to go home. <laughs> He's not going to recover. He's got somewhere between three and three days and three weeks probably in this process of going home, but it was an answer to prayer for me, and it's an answer even if when I get on that plane and I go, he's still not alive. I trust God. Church, trouble's never going away. The enemy wants to take you and let your heart dwell in trouble. Jesus wants your heart to dwell in in him. Let's pray. Father, we just confess that uh, life is more difficult and more of a struggle than sometimes we want to admit to one another. And so we just thank you for this passage, which gives us reasons for hope and helps remind us of how we need to be anchored, Lord, for today in you forever by faith and so lord we believe in you we trust in you we make the choice today to be a people doing your work and doing greater works through prayer in spite of our circumstances in spite of our feelings it's in christ and because of him we can pray this amen This podcast was produced by Journey Bible Church in Olathe, Kansas. If you're interested in learning more about our church, visit journeybible.org. Thanks for listening.